Hi all, let's look at another amazing game from the Norway chess tournaments, one of the strongest tournaments being played this year. Maxim Vachilograv MVL was playing against Veselin Topol Topolov, an ex-World FIDE chess champion. So this was in round three. Let's have a look at this game. D4 was played and Tomplov played knight f6 and after c4 we have e6 as though there's an interest in the Nimzo Indian defense if white plays knight c3 then there's the option to pin the knight we have knight f3 as though it's now Queen's Indian territory d5 which is a very solid response and now transposing into a uh, kind of Slav defense the in particular the semi-Slav Meron system so we here we see e3 which is uh, quite a popular move actually that's the most popular move to play e3 even though it like seems to close in the bishop it means supports added for the c4 pawn knight dd7 bishop d3 and now the most common move here is play d takes c4 gaining a tempo on that bishop uh, to help this bishop now to go onto this diagonal so this is often quite an important diagonal for black white castles a6 and now e4 c5 not moving this bishop yet just sorting out this bishop uh, and allowing the possibility which seems quite aggressive to play d5 uh, because it seems to be threatening to isolate one of black's pawns but of course this pawn is a little bit more isolated potentially as well so how bad is this for black to allow this uh, the usual move is played here which is queen c7 so black allows this seemingly, you know, an isolated pawn here, but black, you know, gets a stronger grip on the e e5 square and this diagonal generally by allowing this. If black, for example, plays e5, this is actually much rarer as an approach on white. Actually, is doing well here statistically. For example, like this, white has a nice strong passed pawn as well as as well as a space advantage so some game has gone like that for example it's generally it's looked down on to play e5 you might think it's quite logical but really this is the way which is it's usually played queen c7 allowing this seemingly you know fragile pawn on e6 so how can white actually uh, try and attack that uh, you might think knight g5 is that possible to immediately attack the pawn well this is a move actually but Games have gone with queen c6 here, and it's still perfectly okay for black. This kind of position, the knight can be evicted back, and black can even castle queenside. So it's not a big problem to have this seemingly fragile uh, pawn if we go back to this position. Uh, white usually does play d takes, f takes. And the most common move is not to play knight g5. This is the most common, bishop c2, bishop d6. And now, actually, in this position, uh, it is a common idea to play knight g5. And it seems a bit strange. You know, this bishop takes h2, for example, here. Uh, it seems as though this bishop takes h2. But does black actually have time to do that? Knight f8 is the most common move, and that is what is played in this position. If bishop takes h2, uh, for example, this position, and now uh, say say like this white has time to trap the bishop virtually with f4 the bishop's kind of in a bad state so yeah there's not really much time to take on h2 here this is this is a very dangerous uh, thing to do so basically we see this retreat move knight f8 and for those you know not used to this this theory it might seem a bit odd but actually black is potentially standing very very well in this position his bishops are sorted out basically there's no major issue with the bishops and if black can castle queenside you know unless there's uh, lines open against this king this could be a, a great deal of peace activity white plays the the most common move f4 here so defending that h2 now black castles queenside and black's first thing perhaps to, to kick the knight first and then maybe take on f4 if the knight's blocking the f pawn usually white plays queen e2 here that's the most common but also this is fairly common queen e1 uh, e5 and here maybe white slightly, 
why it is heading for a kind of planless position, believe it or not. Uh, the two main moves here, knight d5 and f5, but knight d5 might be the more aggressive because it's encouraging black to give up a defensive bishop. Uh, for example, like this, bishop takes. Uh, and now if e takes, bishop d2 or a4 uh, are interesting moves in this position. Trying to sort of get to black's king, it seems the more logical approach given uh, Black's castle queen side to play like this, you know, basically like this, for example, b4, and maybe to try and exploit the weaknesses resulting from that bishop coming off. So, for example, this position has been a few games, and just trying to open up lines, this seems like a logical way to play it, even if it does mean another pawn sacrifice here. White's got good peace activity and potentially some dangerous compensation going on here. This is the kind of position which is really quite tactically interesting and attacking. Uh, maybe more in MVL's style of play. But what he did do was actually the alternative, which has been seen a bit, 21 games in my book. F5 compared to 36 of knight d5. But F5, does it leave white with significant enough plans available? Let's see, I'm just turning any distractions off here. Black kicks the knight and now simply puts his knight back and black seems to be standing quite beautifully here actually in this position uh, there's pressure on that uh, pawn the center closed uh, any knight d5 doesn't seem so convincing now black also might be stretching out with c4 later and maybe using that c5 square white plays king h1 here it seems a little bit on the plan this side and in fact black just centralizes his rook here which is kind of prophylaxis in some respects against any knight d5 because if black can take then this e pawn is already automatically supported by a central rook if you look at black's rooks they're nicely placed in the center uh, connected to each other white's pieces are not so coordinated just yet bishop d2 as though there's a potential battery potential here to try and skewer queen c6 putting more pressure on e4 and also of course b4 and, and this kind of knight b6 and b4 might make even b4 more effective now trying to put more pressure on these key central squares so black is really playing very logically all his pieces are uh, centralized here and coordinated rook d1 which doesn't seem to do much but what else to suggest for white it seems a lot of the tension has been released here and black doesn't even have to play b4 immediately he treads very carefully with knight b6 so trying to reduce the possibility of any knight a4 with b4 now a little bit more effective and white now lashes out tactically but he's not in a great position to do this he plays knight d5 uh, so black's position is really quite amazing from the opening if, if you're a king's engine player you're, you're used to your your queen side being swamped and on the brink of disaster from the opening but here from this apparent you know first an invitation for the nimza engine then the queen's engine then going into a slav and then black still has an interesting position the way he's played it casting queen side here and it seems black hasn't been faced with any major issues from the opening and now white it seems is trying to play tactically here but from a position which doesn't seem that convincing, especially with this later battery against his king, black simply takes on d5 here. After e takes, here is a, uh, maybe, you know, black's looking for some tactical ideas here, uh, you know, to expose the queen. If queen takes, then there's things like bishop takes h6. But black doesn't indulge white in, in any of that. He's happy that he's got this e pawn, which is now liberated to go forward. He just actually moves his queen here to d7. So there's a potential for e4 now, just gaining more space and taking this pawn at leisure in his own time. White plays bishop a5. It's a forcing move for sure, but it's actually ignored here quite resourcefully with e4. So if bishop takes, then we just take here, attacking the queen. So the knight stumbles back. And now black just plays bishop c7. So he's happy he's got this nice pass pawn in the center and white's pawns are a bit fragile here. White actually plays d6 now, which doesn't really 
bode very well. Bishop takes, queen takes, and there isn't that much pressure on black's king. e3, threatening e2, forking the rooks. Knight e2, and you see actually this diagonal is pretty beautiful here in this position. It's already, you know, quite a dangerous position. Uh, Black really wanted to, an immediate blockade on that pawn rather than allowing the e2 possibilities, uh, you know, which are dangerous in conjunction with queen c6. So blockading immediately, but now just queen c6. And White actually felt his position was like busted already. This is a move 28. It's unbelievable, but White resigned here. It's just a very, very unpleasant position. If he defends g2, say rook f3, then rook takes d6, just winning a pawn. And there's an infiltration point on d2 here, which is not very pleasant. Uh, so this, this doesn't look like a very nice position at all with queen d2 now on the cards and also the rooks being attacked. Uh, it seems a total disaster game for white here. Just check this final position just for some possibilities. Uh, here, so after rook takes d6, what does white actually do? If he takes on d6, then queen d2 is coming just to open up this rook on the back row. What does white actually do? Gets his rook out of the way. Queen d2 hitting the queen. If takes, takes. This is just a total disaster, this position. Knight d5, then there's knight f4. The back row is then uh, exposed. So not just the pawn down, but his position is actually uh, completely shattered here. So here, knight e3. And black would have to give up the exchange already. Uh, total disaster. It seems, you know, you can see that theory or that a trodden path is not necessarily a good path from this game. So up to up to this point here in the middle game, uh, this is actually quite a trodden path, f5. Uh, but it doesn't seem to promise white a, an interesting game. It seems white has to play dynamically. Otherwise, um, as, as shown here uh, in this game, it, he didn't really seem to have much of a plan going on. So black all the time also had the possibilities of c4, that alone b4, but he creates the possibilities as well of b4 now on the cards, being much more significant with this knight maneuver. It just seems as though black wasn't given uh, much trouble. The critical tactical points here, uh, if knight takes had happened here, then you know maybe there's a nasty pin. So that that was sidestepped. If queen takes, then maybe there's a little tactic on the queen. You know, either bishop takes or bishop a5. And then things are getting messy. But no, Topolov didn't indulge White in any of the tactical complexities here. He just, you know, kept his positional trump card here with Queen D7. So he's just threatening E4. That's basically uh, a, a very clear-cut way of playing things, letting the bishops get exchanged. And his E pawn is dislocating White. And then this diagonal. This 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 is enough to win the game here. If rook g1, this is very, very passive, knight g4, that, that wasn't really an adequate defense. So, you know, rook f3 was like uh, one of the better ideas. If the queens came off, that's losing uh, a pawn there, potentially, and also rook d2 is, is crushing there. So there didn't seem to be much uh, of a defense going on. Here, knight g4. So uh, here, rook e1 now is, is happening. It was It's just a really horrible position. It seems, you know, straight after the opening with f5, it seems as though Black really just got these trump cards from the opening and simplified things. And a move like this after rook takes d6, it just seems hopeless. An amazing game, because it seems to be one of the more simple wins from the Norway chess tournament so far, as though Black really didn't do much. And it shows how dangerous this Slav defense can be if Black's playing a little bit dynamically, you know, casting queenside later, he didn't really face many difficulties at, at all, it seems, from the surface of this game. What a fantastic, you know, opening choice against uh, Maxim Bachelor-Lagrave. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.